This is part two of John Carmack's talk at QuakeCon 2000. You'll find a link for part one in the comments below. This video features Carmack's answers to the Q&A portion of the talk. I've had to edit things a little bit because of those technical difficulties I mentioned, so I've put some graphics to kind of clarify what he's discussing at certain points. Enjoy part two. You know, I'm still committed to the same platforms that we have been supporting. <coughs> I'm on the Apple side, we will be supporting I only Mac OS X. I know we actually had to make a few somewhat compromises in the game to support the, the Mac OS 9, and I looked at those as kind of strategic issues that we made some compromises there, but I still feel good about you know, like what we wound up doing there. I thought it was important to kind of bring Apple on board with the, the proper technologies and to kind of get them going all as kind of a preparation for, I knew where I always wanted to end up was with the OS X technology that's basically the, the derivative of the original Next Step stuff, which we used for you know, years and years for all of our early game development. And I think very highly of that. I, I mean, the, the whole, like the way the cross-platform stuff worked out on Quake 3, I think in general turned out to be a good thing. It's not like we sold zillions of units of any of the other platforms, but I think it's still been a positive thing. You know, for one thing, it makes sure that our code is made the Dreamcast version a lot easier by the fact that we had a nice portability layer on there. Um, so the, we're definitely still committed to that, but it'll be OSX only on the Macintosh. Um, we're pretty strong on the uh, continuing the SMP acceleration support, which will be a bigger issue for the Mac because they do have, I mean, for all that they'll, you know, that they'll say about it, if you've got half the box speed, it does matter. I'm, you know, and having two processors is, you know, it's a bit of a crutch which can help, uh, you know, help on that. But I think the Apple does have a lot of good things going for them. I think their industrial design is you know, absolutely the best in the business, and uh, you know, I'm happy to continue supporting that. Now, on the Linux side, it's a little bit more complicated in that there's a lot of important infrastructure where Quake 3 sales on Linux were I, you know, disappointing below what, I, what we were hoping to see on that. A lot of it probably has to do with the fact that the infrastructure to set up a 3D, you know, to play a 3D game is just really tough on Linux, where the, at the time we released there were really only kind of two drivers that you could play the game on. You could play it on the 3DFX Moody driver and the Matrox driver. You know, eventually we got Rage Pro support and then NVIDIA support on there. It's been a steady progression from, uh, you know, from Doom when we first started focusing on it through all the things that we've changed and expanded through there to the point where Quake 3 gives you almost all the flexibility that you, you, know, that you could really possibly want on the mod. There's only a couple things that, in looking back, I think, I, I think some bad calls were made on. I, you know, one call in graphics, I, I regret the way I did the dynamic lighting. I should have done it with, I, and it was, I was using performance as kind of an excuse, but it would have just been a matter of, I would have had to do some more gross coding to go ahead and split the multi-texture masses on some of the stuff to get the, the proper lighting with the same performance. I, I, I regret not doing that because while it didn't hurt us because we didn't have any really dark areas, there's enough interesting things that people want to do with, I, you know, brightening up dark areas that, <laughs> And that probably was a bad call. Uh, the only couple other things that, from a like flexibility and expansion standpoint, that I that I think probably would have should have been improved a little bit. The network communication layer was still very very optimized for minimal bandwidth utilization to just be able to like try and play as well as possible over the modem where we have these limited fields that you can stick stuff in and it has to get compressed down a whole lot to go over and. There's, there's wiggle room in there where there's stuff where you can just stash different values and different things, but when you wind up like using the upper four bits of a byte for a different thing, it's, it's just bad. Now, one of the things that, that I still I fret a bit about is that there's a fine line between like intelligent kind of agglomeration and code bloat in different areas. And it's, uh, it's a difficult question because on the early side, there have been some combining a bunch of these things has been a good thing. We've probably knocked out 15,000 lines of code that was, you know, had this kind of Venn diagram intersection between the different areas that we had. You know, we had the game, we had our editor, and we had our command line tools. And a lot of them used fairly similar stuff, but not exactly the same. And combining all those together has been a really good thing. Quake 3 did a lot of things well in terms of the fine, finally exposing things on the client side was the, the kind of last straw to like let mods look like completely different games. And some of the stuff that's been coming out, you just look at that, it's like that's a professional, top-notch user interface and design that it looks like a really different game. And that's great. That's the stuff that you could never do before that, 
I mean, I was always impressed that people managed to get like text HUD displays in some ways in Quake 2, where sometimes I honestly didn't know off the top of my head how they managed to get text over in that position and updated, because it wasn't designed for that at all, and they'd be using kind of other paths for that. Well, now you've got really what you want. You know, you can just go in and say, I want to draw something else on the screen. We'll just go into the drawing function and draw something else there. Um, one of the other things related to that, that while Quake 3 delivers all of this functionality, it's, you know, it has exposed things that are making mods possible, things that wouldn't have been possible before at all. It is becoming, I'm wondering if we're crossing kind of a critical threshold of like, it's not approachable at all anymore, where you look at the stuff and you say, it's like, this is a huge mess of files, and where do I start? And that's a tough question because like, QC originally with Quake was kind of nice in that, I mean, I always kind of, I enjoyed hearing people say, I learned how to go program because I wanted to make a monster do something in Quake. And that's really cool, you know, and it was an approachable, it was an approachable development platform where, I mean, QC by itself was not a turn complete. I mean, you could not do arbitrary programming stuff on it. It limited you in a bunch of ways. Professional developers hated it with no developer, no debugger or anything like that. But, you know, it was an approachable platform where you could kind of look at and say it's like, okay, shambler.qc, you know, I can go mess with something there and just, you know, change things easily. Well, the state that we're at right now, but it's been a strong push of mine to release more and more code. And, in fact, I mean, I probably snuck this by most of the people, but there's probably more lines of code of Quake, you know, Quake 3 that are released publicly than aren't when you count the editor and the tools uh, as well as those sections of the game, probably significantly more. And for the people that are really serious about their development, uh, that makes a big deal. You know, you can go, you can go ahead and go through and find out really how a whole lot of things are working. You can take control over everything, but it does take some of the, the kind of like I'm new to all this. Let's play around with it. It's more in the, the kind of in the arena of commercial developers or potential commercial developers. The people that are doing you know, serious mods now are people that could conceivably be hired the next day to go ahead and work on commercial projects because it requires just about that level of skill set. And I do hope that there's some things that we can do that wind up bringing it back into some of the kind of easier to modify. Uh, maybe not so much in game code because it's hard to make like a dumbed down programming environment that's going to support both like the really cool things and the, you know, and the really trivial things. But the, making things easier is going to be one of, the, one of my goals for for the next project because that is the modification and the custom customizability of everything is one of the most important aspects of the things that we've been doing because it is what can kind of bring a community together and let it kind of express itself in the different ways. And I'm you know I've always been extremely proud of the things that people have done with that and it's one of the major motivators. With Quake 3, we got to the point where almost all the functionality that I think is important has been exposed. You know, with the one exception of the network communication stuff is probably not flexible enough. So we're certainly not going to take any steps backwards on flexibility, but I hope to make things easier. Part of it, the, the integrated development tools will be a nice thing because every test version that we release, every time we release a new patch or whatever, you've got our dev tools. And well, related to that, and another side would be the fact that I, our, we, I banished our last binary file format with this uh, this rev of the new code. The max, because there was always like some of the people that were into it noticing way too that most of the information from the .map files was copied over into the BSD file for collision detection. Uh, and there were ways that you could go, kind of go backwards from that. But the new technology is based around the .map files, which you edit in the built-in editor, are considered final data for the real game also. So the real game loads both the .map file, uh, which it uses for collision detection, and it loads the, uh, you know, the, the process file, which has some kind of graphics process things, fixed key junctions and things like that. So again, that means where anybody playing the game has the ability to run it in editor mode, load a map file directly out of the pack file, and that's something that, as a company, we never quite reached a solid conclusion on, and it's kind of like being made for us the way this technology is going. We had, in previous games, we didn't have a policy. We would sometimes release copies of the maps. You know, if somebody asked nicely and caught us in the right mood, we'd send them a .map file for one of their favorite maps. Uh, the business people are always somewhat worried about the possibility of derived works and people just what business people get paranoid about in terms of user modification stuff. <laughs> and so we never had, I mean, I always kind of wanted to be able to just release the disk of here's the source maps for everything we've ever done. And that would be, you know, that would be pretty cool. But 
there's enough issues and reasons why that never happened, and I mean, it may still happen in the future. I think that would be a nice thing. I mean, it, it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be like a big event or anything, but that would be nice to get out at some point. But now, just the way the technology works, uh, there is no source data which you need for editing and modifying anything, which doesn't become part of the, you know, of the actual distrib you know, distributable there. And that should be a positive thing there, because. I know that I've been, well, my focus has been up till now on enabling things, and I know full well that it hasn't been friendly and that it's, there's been this barrier to entry, but the people that I had been targeting most of the improvements at are the people that are going to work through that, and it's kind of the, you know, the gateway through it. If you can't figure out how to go ahead and compile, you know, compile a DLL and link it into the game and everything, then, well, you probably wouldn't enjoy the experience if it was laid out more clearly for you. But, I am hoping now that we've kind of got, the developers should have everything that they need for like hacking on that part, so that I want to make the other parts easier, so that I, and things that we've talked about before, like having map, I, if you're going to have make a map editor easy for people to use and hack around with, having some special modes where it's like only drag entities around mode, and so you can just kind of like rearrange your map, and make, bring some of that kind of like what makes the modification fun for the more serious people, and bringing it down to a more accessible level, so that people can figure out, with, like, without too much trouble, how to take their favorite level and move a few things around and play differently with their friends, that type of thing. Uh, so those are probably the primary, the primary kind of changes from a user flexibility standpoint that we're looking at. Uh, I'm not going to go in too much on the, you know, the technology that we're, that we're actually working on, on uh, how it will affect things, but it should wind up being easier for the most part to get things that make sense where there's going to be completely different rules that you have to pay attention to for how to make something run at an acceptable high speed. It's going to be much more tied to like which lights you use on which surfaces rather than you know some of the things that people have had to worry about so far. I'm willing to be outvoted on some of these issues that you have things like vehicles and I you know controlling other things and they're just never been my you know my cup of tea for gaming. But all those types of things now are possible and can you know can be worked out in like an elegant framework rather than just kind of like ways of, of patching things together and forcing things into different ways there. So I'm excited about what we're going to have there in terms of what we're getting out of it on the modification. And in the community, the real the interesting thing is that for the first time the community will basically be working on exactly the same footing that the developers are. You know, it's not there's going to be no time lag in terms of deployment of tools from anything else. I, I mean, there will probably still be the, the lag of release of the various source parts. And that's, you know, there's no conspiracy, malice, anything to that. It really is just a matter of we're pretty busy most of the time right after a release, and everybody just keeps pestering us about when do we get the source code for the latest patch and all that. It's like we do intend to get around to those things, but they do take some effort to, uh, to actually get done at the company. It's hard to say even how much of a percentage of the people that matters to, and we used to have the big arguments at it about, well, the, the mod community and the online community, there are you know, the hardcore fanatics, and they don't account for you know, perhaps necessarily a whole lot of the true market size. And when, when things come up about, well, do we want to cater or pander to this in a particular way, uh, it was, there were real questions about whether is this a good chunk of our users, or is this just the fringe? And we shouldn't really be doing anything for that because the bulk of our buyers are going to be people that just go in, buy it off the shelf, don't ever go online, don't find out things on the internet. And really through, you know, through Quake 3 is when I think the entire company finally came to terms and realized that no, the, the community of people that follow the web pages, try out other mods, play with different things, that becomes like a large chunk of our game, you know, of our actual market. And it's been, when you can, with 2020 hindsight, look back and see how important it's been for us and how much we've benefited by having this open attitude and the fact that, you know, here we are, many people that have been coming to, to QuakeCon for years and years here, basically on this game that you can't play, you know, you can't just go grab some, you know, some console game and play it and play it and play it and play it like that because eventually you just kind of like work out all the different kinks of it and being able to go ahead and say, well, I love this game, I'm going to take it apart and I'm going to like fix the thing that the damn designers didn't do right or I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go modify it to be something, you know, more the way I think it should have been. And then, well, there's certainly not too many people that actually do that, but then going and getting that out to your 5,000 closest friends on the internet that are going to play the game with you. And I think it's a great thing. 
With the PC, the fact that the communities live on the internet, and then you've got your IRC, your instant messaging, your web pages that become the focus of everything, that's just so absolutely critical. And it's going to be, are you going to be able to have a community when you go into your office, you check the new stuff, you know, you like scribble down something on a pad of paper, and then like go into your living room and, uh, and boot up your console to go do that? and when you can't communicate with people uh, effectively on there. And there's, there's possibilities, there's interesting things, but they're going to be working at a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And uh, the community-based aspects, all the web pages and, and that stuff has been, that's what the console people look at the PC space and envy to a degree. Doom, the new Doom title, which does not have an official name yet, it is very much, we are, we are setting out to say this is going to be a spectacular single-player game. And we know, we don't want to talk much about it because <coughs> Anything, if you take any group of people here, it's going to be evenly divided into like a dozen camps about what was the crucial aspect that, you know, that made Doom Doom and all this, and we just don't want to get into those arguments. We're going to make our decision and we're going to go that way, but it is going to be, I mean, we will say that the, a lot of people will say that the multiplayer deathmatch made Doom Doom, and while that's going to be present in here, it is not our central focus. And just like with Quake 3, I do think it was a good thing to pick a focus and say, you know, we are focusing on the multiplayer gaming experience and single-player game was derived off of that. Uh, we are very solidly picking a single-player focus on this. So it should be far away our best single-player game because we are going to be devoting significantly more effort to it. Uh, the other stuff with the, the mod community and things, that's one of those things where it's, it's just one of those wonderful convergences where the technology just, we just look at this and all of a sudden all these decisions that I've been making kind of in, independently and just say like what's the best thing for us to do for this technical reason or for this platform reason. You know, they kind of wind up, wound up so close that then just with like a little bit of work there, we kind of tie it all together and it becomes this wonderful new thing for the user community to work with. That's it for now. I'll have more QuakeCon videos in the months ahead. Thanks for hanging in there. We'll see you in the next video. Ah!